All right, everybody, I'm back. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, and who's recording? Or maybe I started recording, I don't know. Anyway, if you are recording, I, I ask that you share this privately and not publicly because um, there's a couple of slides that I've been asked not to make public outside of real time. So please um, respect that so that I can share this with you in this intimate session. We good? Can I get some thumbs up? Can I get a can I get an hallelujah? Can I get a praise God on this? All right. I think we're going to go. It's an intimate crowd here tonight. And we've got a ton of people visiting from other places. I don't know if you can, can we get audio out of the computer? Hey, does everybody, does all these folks at home want to say hi to our group over here? Or not. Hello. 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 Hi. Hello. It's not wow. coming through. Okay, it's not coming through. It's going direct to my headphones. Uh, that's and you no. Know, this is going to be. Dumb. What? Why do I have headphones? I said hi to your headphones. Oh yeah, hi to my headphones. All right, everybody. So let's start this thing off. Let's see if I can get the slideshow starting. So first off, thank everybody for coming. I really appreciate it. Like this is such short notice, and thanks for supporting this. I'm kind of doing it to honor all the people that have been um, involved with this and people that are curious, um, new people, old people, um, really old people like me. And um, it's ironic because today, hi everybody, thanks for coming. And I'll try to pay attention to the invisible fourth wall here, as well as the invisible fourth wall behind me of like, there's like 15 people on, on the live stream too. So it's pretty cool. And all over the world, we got Carl there and we've got Chester and we've got Lob and we've got Joey Raposa and a bunch of other people like, like old friends and allies and new friends. And it's kind of awesome. So thanks everybody for coming. And um, I just got back from trans states. I presented at that in Northampton. And it's a really cool conference. I don't know how many of you do occult conferences, but they're really like, it was like, it felt like family there. I made so many friends that I thought I'd already had. <laughs> like, it feels like I've known them for a really long time and I was hanging out with them for two days. It's really, really cool. Um, and just like kind of getting into that community, they're mixing up an academic thing with, with like practitioners and artists and like doing a really neat kind of synthesis of, people doing really serious research and using big words and explaining things in sociological and metaphysical terms. And then people that are like hardcore practitioners talking about nitty gritty magic. So it's a really, it's a really interesting fusion. Um, and so with that, welcome everybody. I'm Tom Banger and I'm gonna tell the story of the Temple of Psychic Youth in the US. And I'm hoping to kind of start a dialogue with folks because there's some psychic youth from the UK here as well and so if anybody's interested in talking about what it was like and kind of talking about the differences or you know contrasting the way things worked in the UK or the way that people think things should work in the UK versus the way that they worked in the US I think that would be a really interesting talk and something that'll be cool for the ages so now, if I can make the advancer work, right? That's always the challenge. I've been doing this crap for like 30 years and I still can't make a slide advance. I don't know what my problem is. It's just like, is it when the cameras come out, the spirits disappear? Come on. All right, fine, space bar. All right, so this was my basement in 1986. And I lived in a $125 a month basement. And we I had a stack of TVs in there. 
and this is actually relevant. I'm trying to set the scene of like what it was like in 1985, 1986 in Denver, Colorado. So I had I'm this. Tom, I, Tom sorry. Uh, we yes. can't see your uh, screen. You uh, can't and see I, my screen. No, and I think in terms of share screening on Zoom, you are you the host? Are I'm you the host, to host of this Zoom? Because uh, uh, screen sharing is uh, turned on by the host, I think. That's right. Is that Carl talking? Yeah, that's me. Okay, I've got these voices in my head. Everybody thinks I'm going <laughs> schizophrenic. I'm um, happy to be in your head. Yeah, I'm happy to have you here. <laughs> Let me see what Zoom has to say. Okay, it says, I was sharing before. You could see the screen before, no? No. Is that true? No. True. Could you see the screen before when I was sharing? No. no. So you've never seen the screen. No, okay. So who's who's like who's presenting as hosts here? Did the first person that came on end up taking over? Wait. Let me see. Share screen. Oh, here we go. You joined as host, Tom. All right. Yeah, that's what I thought. I mean, this is my show, baby. <laughs> um, let's see. Screen two is the black one. Okay. Identify screen and share and see the Sharon Muffin. Okay. There we go. And then we'll switch over to this and we'll F5 that. All right. No, no. No, I'm not uploading my document. What's wrong with me? See, this is the thing, like it's this internal, it's this internal dialogue that was really like sort of key to Topi, right? Now we can see it. about yourself and getting to know yourself better and trying to understand why you can't do the simplest things on a computer when people are watching. So this is my basement in Colorado circa 1985. It was a $125 a month, like 800 square foot basement with a faucet, like a cold water spigot in the back, no plumbing, and like a 45 year old refrigerator in the front and a hot plate. And this is where it all happened, baby. You can see these TVs in the background and those TVs, <laughs> Those lousy TVs are what actually got me a ticket on the 1986 Psychic TV tour. More on that later. So to set the stage, these um, these books were starting to come out. And these were sort of the, I guess you could say, kind of the Bibles before the Psychic Bible came out. Research and modern primitives and things like that were kind of just starting to hit some kind of critical mass and the industrial culture handbook and these things were sort of like inspirations for us at that time um there wasn't an internet so you had to go find these stupid books or get copies of them from people or something like that it was like you young people have it so easy today compared to us you guys can hear me okay out on over at home yep sounds good okay so i was i was hugely into these books some of these books came out after Actually, like I started getting involved with Toby, but it's just to kind of set the stage. You know, I wanted to have a nice symmetrical picture of research documents. Let's give this give this clicker another chance. It didn't it didn't work for Lionel Snell last night either. So I don't feel too terribly deprived here. It's just it's a no, it's a cheap ass, a cheap ass clicker. Okay, so Psychic TV came out in, I don't know, 83? When, B? When did they come out? 83, 82? What? Okay, he says 82. He knows better than I was. He was there. But, um, so they came out with Fourth to Hand a Chance and, like, sort of started, like, showing up in pictures with, like, strange rings through, through intimate places of their bodies and, and doing this thing that kind of combined, like, was trying to use the tools of magic, modern magic. And it was really intriguing to some of us who are already interested in the occult. And it was kind of a new approach. Um, chaos magic hadn't really hit the US. There were still like some magazines coming out, but it hadn't really hit critical mass. There weren't a lot of books out yet. So that's kind of the thing. So in a nutshell, what Topi was, was it was a global network. We were kind of, I, I would say we were doing secular shamanism. It was post-punk, post-industrial, post like Christian, post um, toasty, everything. We were just kind of winging it. 
I'd say it was an analog social network. It was kind of similar to a, to like a BBS or a Wikipedia or something like that, where people were sharing information. And by the way, anybody that wants to contradict me on this or like insert themselves and turn this into more of a dialogue, they're welcome to. Um, don't like necessarily feel entitled to tell this whole story. Um, and sort of our Bible, if you will, was the great book, which gave some ritual instructions I'll talk about in a little bit. It was founded in the early 80s by Genesis Peorge. And I'm, I'm not sure, I'm honestly not sure if it was put, it's sort of, it, it's hard to say if it was put out as sort of a satire or as an experiment. And depending on when the interview was done by whom, Genesis always had different answers about why, why it was actually founded, sort of what the motivation was, whether it was to see like, hey, let's get people to do this crazy thing and see if they'll do it. Or, you know, hey, kids, let's start a cult. Or if it was like a really kind of deliberate thing. I mean, there's definitely some deliberate doctrinal things that I've seen in some of the letters and stuff that have been published lately. But Genesis and, and the early people, I think, played it pretty coy with what the motivation was behind it. Is that, does that align with what you know, B? Yeah. Right, yeah, it was like just kind of this crazy experiment. And, and then with sort of different, on different days, they'd be like, well, then we could do it for this reason. And it's, well, then we could do it for this reason too. Oh, this is a great idea because there's all these reasons we could do it. Yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of the way it feels. So it was like, um, the caliph of the OTO always described it as preschool for occultists, which is my favorite, which is my favorite thing is like, he was like, when people like sort of graduate from Topi, then they'll go into a real magical order and like become real magic people and like, you know, learn how to do banishings and all the proper things that, that magic people do. And that was true for some people, but certainly not me. I've stayed in kindergarten my whole life um, <laughs> and enjoyed every minute of it. But so we, we got, I mean, it was a distribution channel. I mean, that's really what I see it as the most is that some people chose to get involved at a deep level, but most people were just, were, I mean, 10% of the people, like anything else, kind of the Pareto rule, 10% of the people were, were serious and committed on one level and the rest of the people kind of wanted to engage on their own terms. And so primarily, I mean, a lot of the engagement, we had really deep engagement with the people that were deeply engaged, but the majority of our engagement was with people that were just exchanging information with us, more or less. And I think I'll talk about that more too. So I call it, uh, it's, an, it's an occultural wiki by post. We did everything by mail because that's all there was. Some stuff by phone, but phone was really expensive. It cost like, I don't know, when we first started, it was like 75 cents a minute to call the UK. So we had to have all kinds of scams to make that work out. And it's hyper syncretic. Like, I mean, I know that, that syncretism and cultural appropriation and things like that are sort of naughty words right now, but I, I would argue that, that culture is inherently syncretic and without um, syncretism and, and adaptation of things and some form of appropriation, we'd still, I mean, we probably still wouldn't have figured out how to make clay pots, much less, you know, bronze weapons and nukes and things like that because we all borrow from each other and i i love that in my personal spiritual life and generally intellectually so anybody got any questions or comments from the from the chat i can't look at it can i All right, hearing none, I will challenge, I will charge blithely on. So um, in 1986, well, 85, me and a friend, so I was getting, I was recovering from like sort of a little flirtation with, with addictive drugs. And my, I ended up with a bit of money to start a, to start a business. And so me and my friend, you know, like being the intelligent visionaries that we were and with no business sense at all, decided to start a video art gallery in this super posh um, place in, in Denver, which was where I was based at the time. And these, so needless to say, Denver was not ready for a bit for a $1,000 a month art studio at that time that just showed movies. 
So it would have done great now, maybe in New York, but it didn't do great in Denver in 1985 at all. So we got evicted and thrown out. And I had this big stack of TVs in my $125 a month basement and a, and a bunch of video things and two 16 millimeter projectors and an eight millimeter projector. So I was a punk promoter in Denver um, from like 83 to 85. And I was kind of retiring, but the punk band DOAs and Dead Kennedy's manager, this Canadian guy named Ken Lester called me up and said for about, a, about a DOA gig. And I'm like, well, what else you got right now? And he goes, I've got this band called Psychic Television. And, and he was sort of, you know, a West Coast kind of San Francisco type guy. So he pronounced it psychic television. Like, I mean, he was used to kind of pitching it to people that had no idea what it was. So I'm like, psychic TV is coming to America? No way. Like, they're like, I love that band. I totally want to put them on. And they're like, well, they cost, I think they wanted $1,500. And then they needed a back line. You had to rent all this equipment. And you, only one place had like a Trace Elliott bass amp in the entire Denver. And it was like a hundred dollars a day. And like, they wanted an Ampeg bass rig. And that was like a hundred dollars a day. And so when you added up the lights and the video and the production and then renting the venue, cause I didn't have a venue, it would have cost like $2,500, $3,000 to do the show. And I started doing the math and I'd done shows like this before. I did a show with Neubauten in a junkyard where I charged $25 a ticket. But all the money went to the band because I got the junkyard for free because they were selling hot dogs. So, so they, um, so there was no way to do it. Like I was like, okay, well, could we sell fifty dollars, fifty tickets for sixty dollars? No. Could we sell? You know, there's no way we could sell. You know, a thousand tickets. You know, or, or you know, five hundred tickets. You know, the ticket price pretty much was five dollars a head. So that would have been six hundred people, and there weren't six hundred people with funny haircuts in Denver at that time, much less. Um, am I breaking up over there? I'm hearing audio artifacts. Everything okay? All right. Sounds good. Hearing none. All right. So, so anyway, I said, but you know what? I've got all this AV equipment, so I'll go on tour with them, and I'll bring my AV equipment, and you guys can like you pay gas and give us like a per diem, and then the, and then the band will be able to charge the venues more money. They'll be able to charge the promoters more money because they're bringing their own they're bringing their own backline. So you just rent your own backline when you come into the country, and I'll provide the AV backline, and then it'll be like it'll be easy peasy lemon squeezy. So I don't think I said that, but they but anyway. So Ken agreed, and they negotiated it, and I was on the tour. So then all I needed was a vehicle. I didn't have a car or, or a, and we needed a van to put all those crappy TVs in. Remember slide one, those, um, those TVs, I actually had to like pull them out of, of um, frames and stuff. They weren't painted at the time yet. So we, I found this guy named, and people don't like him very much anymore in general. And so, I mean, I'm kind of reluctant to name him, but I have to, cause he's part of the story. So this guy named Scott, nobody had a van and he was a guy that I barely knew. He just moved to Denver from New Mexico. And we like, he was like, yeah, sure. I'll go. And so we like packed the stuff in the van and drove off to San Francisco to LA. And we met with Gary Tobar from golden voice. And he gave us a bunch of money, like a bunch, like a, suitcase full of cash to rent stuff and we loaded up a trailer and then we met up with this guy rob and ken lester and we were off on the road so here's a here's a picture of um of the canada show i actually took these pictures they're probably among like five decent pictures i've taken in my life um and actually like had the money to develop before they decayed but so this is that's Genesis on the left, obviously, and then the recently refound Alex Ferguson on the right with an unidentified mind player, and then there they are on stage in their glory. Um, Matthew Best, Allure is on the left, and um, that's Dave. Can't remember his last name. And then we've got Genesis and Alex in his spectacular green satin shirt. So then we went bopping around New York, the tour ended in New York and we went to um, Niagara Falls. And I was like, Jen, you know, the whole problem with this, like at that time, sort of Sleep Chamber seemed like they were the Toby US and they were sort of presenting themselves as it were, as being the temple of psychic youth for North America and sort of had this inverted thing and for info, you know, call us. And, um, 
And I was like, you know, this is never going to work because we've got, we okay? Let me know if the sound sucks. So anyway, we get to, we get to New York and we're at Niagara Falls. And I was like, Niagara Falls. I think we lost the audio. Yep, here. lost here. Tom, if you can hear us, we cannot hear you. I think Tom got dropped by the internet. Knowing him, he will try again, I'm sure. Well, Fooey, hi, everyone. I guess it's time for a smoke break. Uh, Does that mean, wait, we're supposed to stop smoking? <laughs> <laughs> Well, so far, this has been pretty fun. I've been enjoying it. This is a bus story. I pulled out my my letters and I'm doing my letters from the from the station as he's going. And I've got like my first letter from Denver and I got involved like, right? So my first letter from Tom and then like it transitions, right? And it goes to where San Diego or something. And then the letters shift. But I've got like, I've only got one or two from Tom. So like what what time frame is that? What is that? That's like well the the first letter that I got was I think 86 or 87 telling me that I wasn't old enough. <laughs> <laughs> and a call back later. So they were they were up on their on their uh, accountability stuff. That's cool. But yeah, so yeah, right around uh, 86, 87, what did... Can you hear me? Check, yes. Yeah, you're back. Yeah, okay, God, I wish this would feed back. I, I wish that the audio from in there, you guys were telling great stories on the on the phone too. I hope that I hope that turns out someplace. That's really cool. I keep doing that and, and do your thing and hopefully it'll turn up on the recording and then we'll have like like your sort of back channel. It'll be like mystery movie theater. Does anybody in the UK know that know that um know that thing where they have they show these old like these old cheesy 50s horror movies and then they have silhouettes of these two smart ass robots like talking to each other like during the whole thing, sort of making like snarky comments like give us and butthead about the thing like oh my god that's the fakest rocket crash I've ever seen and like these really like kind of bitchy comments but totally do that and then and then hopefully we'll get it in the mix and we can make it like part of the part of the record of of this event. Um so, and Lob is somehow, and Michael, two, three. Have you guys gone to the, um, you guys are in Arizona, right? Yes. Lob yes. and Michael. So have you been, have you checked out that bookstore? Which one? That bookstore in Tucson? Oh, no. There's this psychotically amazing bookstore in Tucson now. Like it has like, I don't know, they've got like, it's an occult shop and they're doing like secondhand occult books and it's huge. It's really good. Anyway, sorry, I'm like, I'm there tomorrow. I'm, yeah, let's go. I'm boring. <laughs> um, I'll, remind me, I'll, I'll, I'll share the, I'll share the info with them, with yeah. you on it. They just opened and it's sick. They have like thousands of, of crazy obscure occult books. It's really good. Okay, so you can see the screen now. No. You can't see the screen. Cannot. Can oh, that's because I didn't share it. Okay. No. That would that that like. <laughs> First thought, best thought. Okay, here we go. Share screen. All right, and it's screen two. All right, can you see it now? Okay, yes. cool. So, could, did you hear the audio when it clicked in? No, because I wasn't sharing the screen yet. Let me see if I can make it click again. I'm going to go backwards. Okay, there it went. Okay, so you're going to hear it, and then I'm going to unplug the mic for a second. Up and we don't get through tomorrow, I'll just say this is Genesis Peorage of the Temple of Psychic Youth headquarters in London, England, wishing well and wishing best dreams and better futures to everybody in the Temple of Psychic Youth headbanger party in Denver. This really is the beginning of the next phase, the invasion and growth of the network. Okay, so now I'm going to drop. So long story short, we're in, I, I'm going you back with me, folks. That's right. Yep. Yes. Copy. 
Copy. Copy. Okay, we're gonna do one more of those things. So sorry for the folks here. I'm trying to like be inclusive. Um, and it's actually disruptive for everybody, but best intentions. So in when we were in New York and I was like, Jen, you're doing it all wrong. Like, like if you're gonna do the Temple of Psychic Youth in North America, you gotta get a mailing list and a bulk mailing permit because people in the US don't understand international commerce stuff at all. And like, we don't know what an international resupply coupon is. Or we don't know what like international money orders are. And it's like a big pain in the neck and nobody's gonna do it. Like that might work in Europe where people are used to being friendly and collaborative across nations, but it's not gonna work here. So Jen was like, okay, do it. I'm like what? Oh, yeah, just do it. I'll send you a mailing list in a while. So then I tried calling them and they were busy because it turned out their manager had ripped them off when they got to the UK and they were like going through all this drama with that. And I think maybe they were in the process of moving houses or something too. Like there was a bunch of kind of turmoil when they got home. So then when we went, so I wanted to do something for my birthday and I was sort of advertising it because my birthday had gotten back in August and I wanted to start it. And my birthday seemed like a good like excuse to have a party and sort of do some kind of inaugural celebration. So exactly, <laughs> the, I got, finally got a hold of Genesis the day before my birthday, which happened to be September 11th, 1986. So on the very anniversary of the day that this thing happened to fall on is that when that phone call was recorded, which I think is kind of cool and synchronistic and I don't know, and, and plus the 9-11 connection too, it's kind of fun. So that's the um, that's that. So we had this thing, and we showed some Kenneth Thanger movies, and we showed some some videos, and somebody had given me a bunch of Datura, and I don't know if anybody's familiar with Datura, but it's like it's also known as Jimson weed, and we got a lot of it. Like somebody gave me like a pound of it or something, and we boiled it into tea. And very cautiously, like admonished people, like this is not a toy, you know, do it. But everybody was like, oh, what? You think I'm a punk? I've done acid before. I'm like, I haven't tried this before, but I'm pretty sure it's nothing like acid. Like, you know, use at your own discretion, please. You know, your mileage will definitely vary. So I'm like, I am. Um, so a bunch of people took it. And I don't know if anybody's familiar with that particular it's it's not called a psychedelic. It's called a delirium, because it 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 um like that's the thing that Don Juan smeared on Carlos Castaneda that made him fly across the Atlantic Ocean or something. And it's it's um anyway. So I drank a bunch of it, and then the first thing that happened was my throat became so dry that like nothing would soothe it. Like just water just felt like it was just pouring down like a clay pipe of of and just like going straight into my and then i'm not gonna like do a john waters and like tell you like every detail of my trip but anyway it was a very strange experience and and um and i saw things that weren't there and so did everybody else and like some people like made the mistake of like calling the calling the emergency room and ended up being chained to beds because they were seeing stuff that wasn't there. And there's one guy that still wants to, there's one guy that still wants to kill me because that, because um he thought I was having sex with his girlfriend. Like I was in another, like in another part of town and his girlfriend was sitting on the sofa, tripping her brains out too. And he thought I was there like laying on the couch with her, having sex with her is like and and still like doesn't like me because of that and he's like you made me take this stuff and i'm like I, I told you not to take it in fact i told you specifically not to take it buddy because i know that you know you're the guy <laughs> <laughs> you're the guy that you're the guy that knew how to that, that had taken acid before weren't you but um anyway it was it's just like my my vision was blurry for the rest of the week and um, it took a while to recover. So I'm going to talk just a little bit about just like sort of, so one of the first actions we did, so this was early on, but the pictures are sort of out of context. So here's Caress and Jeunesse. So the first action, remember, those of you who remember the temple, remember that there was a campaign to do 23 psychic crosses in your neighborhood. So we got the people that were interested here to do it. And there's still a couple of them around here and there. Um, 
But Jeunesse and Caress, like three or four years later, are posing in front of a house that had one left, abandoned house that had one left over. And then the other thing we made was these assume this phone is tapped things. And everybody that's here will get some of those. Um, sorry, you guys that, um, that are remote, you won't get any phone is tapped stickers. But that was sort of the first artifact that we produced out of Toby US. And um, so then we kept doing stuff. We kept making pamphlets and stuff. And we'll sort of I'll talk about that more. I'm kind of more kind of on the psychic TV kind of tip right now. So we'll get more into the Topi Doctrine stuff in a bit here. So then we've got, you know, so this is the entrance to my basement apartment. So in 1988, Genesis decided that he wanted to do a, I'm going to refer to them as him now because that's what he was presenting of as at the time. And um, that's like most all of this story until kind of later in the story, I'll refer to Jen as he. And then when Jen changes his presentation, I will change his pronoun, their pronoun. Um, so Genesis sent like $3,000 or something or budgeted $3,000 to get the school bus because they wanted to, he wanted to recreate the kind of Mary Prankster's insane drive across the country for the tour. And also save money and also they like to be able to sleep on the road, you know, while we were in transit. So it would save money on hotel rooms, enable us to be able to get more kind of concurrent, more compressed travel time between gigs because we wouldn't have to sleep on long drives. We could sleep on the bus. And um, so we got this bus. It was a 1966 six passenger Ford F-150 school bus. And we... It already had been fitted out as an RV, so it was kind of set up. Um, I've got pictures elsewhere of us like actually framing it out, but we framed out uh, like we split the we split the rear of the bus in half, we split it in half, and then built an equipment thing that you could access from both from the top and from the bottom, or yeah, from the top of it and the back. So we could put equipment under there, and then there was another compartment for suitcases, and then we had a bunch of mattresses that laid out on it. And um, so that's Bussy. And here's some tickets, random tickets for it. Here's us getting ready to go. I think that's Paige in the Volkswagen there. Um, for those of you on the phone who remember old Paige, I don't know what happened to her. And um, yeah, so that's our spot. And that was the that was the bus. And then all kinds of crazy stuff ensued with that silly bus. Um, so we we'll talk about sort of OTO and chaos magic and sort of what was Topi about. So I would say sort of OTO thing was more structured and Topi was less structured back to the preschool sort of thing. And then with sort of chaos magic in between where they were doing more things. And I think there was kind of a constant back and forth within the temple of psychic youth between what I called structuralists who were people that predominantly kind of had their roots and and practices kind of based in a more traditional kind of ceremonial magic, like naming things and banishing things and doing circles and things like that. And then people that were doing purely kind of Austin Spare influenced, um, you know, like more kind of sorcery type stuff. So as time went on, and Carl will probably have more to say about the kind of about the kind of thing. So Basically, anybody that wanted to do a station and, a, and do a, um, that wanted to start a temple could, and a lot of people did, and so there just started being a ton of um, of Topi outlets. Um, so there were a bunch of UK things. Carl, who's on the call, started a um, Carl Abrahamson started the Stockholm one, and Topi Netherlands started around that time too but they didn't last very long. Um, and then a bunch of Topi UK things happened, Steel and Topi South in Brighton and Topi Hart, I think it was in Birmingham and Topi Yorkshire and Topi Glasgow and Topi Glastonbury was there, Topi West. And then there was Topi Midlands. And I don't know what else. Um, I think there were a couple others at some times too. And then we started, a I think Topi Canada was the first one and then Texas and then maybe, and then, Topi No Cow and then and then Topi Sol. And then there was a there was a Berlin Topi and there was Pyromania, which was Boris. And then we had a Topi Italy and then all kinds of stuff. So 
sort of our model, I think, our feedback model. So people would send us stuff, you know, and different things. Now, I'll talk about some of the more, again, more occult stuff. This is more kind of just the way that the network worked. So people would send us something. And this is one of those stupid life cycle things that they always use for business, which I think is fun and sort of educational and, and a satire as well. But so somebody would send somebody would send something out and so then they'd read it and they'd think about it and then they'd write something about it and send it back to us. And then we'd look at it and compile it and sort of spit it back out to them. We created this feedback loop of where people were doing were doing research and we were sending sending it back to them so that they could respond to it and, and continue. It was, a, I mean, it was really like a blog or, or really similar to what people are doing there, but it was over more time and it was more one-on-one -on -one because, I mean, people were writing with their hands, sending things in the mail and, um, and it was really great. Like it was really, you know, and so, you know, this is what we were using at the time. You know, so we were using snail mail and my bulk rate postage stamps and um, regular mail and we would sort mail. You had to sort it by zip code. So we print these things out. That's why I had to get a computer. So I got a computer and started learning how to do databases strictly so that I could sort the freaking zip codes so that I could have postal codes so that I could so that I could do a compliant sort of the mail so that I could get instead of paying 22 cents, I could pay like 16 cents to send these things off and um the dos 3.0 was the original 3.2 was what i was using in dbase 3 and so literally i mean this was our printer the xerox 9500 revolutionized the occult world because it enabled you to throw a bunch of sheets of paper in and read and it would spit them out stapled and double-sided it was awesome and, um, and that was like the first printer that really did that. So we would produce these things. I mean, a lot of the stuff that I did, I typed on a brother typewriter and um, stored on floppy disk when I did computers. So we started putting out these documents. We did all kinds of this stuff. I mean, so I discovered that people wanted sage smudge, you know, the sage that's tied together and like, like, woody, like, shaman people like wave around and do in their in their sweat lodge things and stuff like that so in colorado there was a big new age thing and also in new york there were a bunch of people that couldn't get sage so i would stop on the side of the highway and, like trim the stage and sage and wrap it up in yarn and we invented a thing called this was towards the very end of of, of topi but uh, of my involvement we started a thing called coyote clan where we were going to try and do like new age stuff and pretend like we were like a new age thing in Colorado and sell smudge. And I sold wormwood and stuff like that to try and get money into the temple. It was like, I mean, I had spent time with the Krishnas and read a lot of books about like how organized crime funds itself, like biker gangs and things like that. And how like mafias work, like in terms of like, it's a very decentralized economic model. And so I, I tried to like, like, I studied those models of the way that like, of the way that different types of groups work to try and figure out the economic models of ways to create like pyramid schemes, essentially, where people at the, like where everybody would get, like it would filter up and people would be able to support the thing that they were doing through, you know, through the thing that we were doing. So we would, I would sell stuff to the, you know, I would produce stuff and sell it to the, or trade it to the, to the um to the various access points so then they'd have stuff that they could sell and make more stuff and then send it to us and it was sort of everything was kind of this feedback loop and where you know there was markup or sort of you know like vig as they say in the mafia like sort of at every step of the of the process then things would sort of feed up and feed down so that so that people could sustain the networks that they were running and then here's a couple of the publications i'm super proud of the revolver because it's got the revolver is new wheat and the and the bullet is hot it and i just think that made me write a whole article about the alchemy of the revolver and how it could be used as a wand and then the first collaborative project we did everybody of course since it was psychic tv everybody was experimenting with using the television as a scrying stone and as a medium and as a um as an oracle and things like that. So we got lots of stuff written about that. 
and so I did sort of a mashup of it and and wrote some sort of binding things to kind of put structure to it and make it a coherent document. But we ended up printing like a 16 page thing about television magic that was really well received and and still is um, still one of the coolest things we put out, I think. Um, so what was the temple about? <laughs> So there were a few things, sort of clues in various things was that like was the was the cuttings of psychic youth was that, you know, what made you a psychic youth? So you were meant to show commitment by getting, you know, or solidarity by getting a psychic skull, cross, you know, a psychic cross somehow tattooed on your body. I still got mine someplace Here's it on this side. And um, and then when you became initiated or whatever, when you sort of had, had made a solid commitment, you would do three parallel scars someplace, which I still have too, but you can't find them because I've got a lot of scars on top of them. And then a lot of people chose to get piercings. Um, I wasn't sure if there would be adults or children here or something. So I, so <laughs> and I love that picture. Uh. You, you should encourage people, they should all get a Walkman of some kind, a recording Walkman. Mm -hmm. and, and start thinking of it as a talisman as well as a machine. Mm -hmm. And Polaroid cameras the same. Yeah. Obviously they're not all, all going to be able to afford that straight away, but that's what they should aim for. Yeah. Start learning to literally spy on reality. And spy on themselves and spy on patterns. Are happening all the time and also learn to cut up their own rituals right they the invisible language that's going on of editing and yeah exactly the new linguistics we're trying to get them to integrate their character completely that's what we're trying to do mm -hmm. right until they can do that and lose that self about what other people's opinions and and control over them is doing, then they're going to have problems. They've got to break the, ta the taboos that they actually hold themselves. Mm. Not ever accept any inherited system of values or morals. That's not to say that they can't decide themselves that they agree with them that they've heard but they should never, ever accept any, per se. Right. Never, ever accept any. So we've got Austin Spare, and so he was art as magic and the death posture and um, magical alphabets and sigils. So now so we're going to talk about the famous 23 sigil, I believe. So here's some, here's some stuff you can read by Austin Spare himself, but I'll just tell you. So the, the core ritual, the way you became involved with, with with the temple was for those of you who don't know was on the 23rd day of the 23rd month uh 2323 supposedly somewhere around there you were supposed to maybe light a candle or do something that put you in a ritual space so perhaps light a candle do burn some incense you know make yourself comfortable and you would have something maybe that you had prepared beforehand or that you were doing you were doing there that represented a desire and this is like there's a the, Mr. Sebastian says this really nicely on the first chance, and it's it's written in the Gray Book. But sort of the idea was was you and visualizing your future, and then you would somehow represent that. And a lot of people chose to represent that sort of in a Sparian sigil because that was kind of the reference point that most people had. But you didn't have to do that. It could be a collage or some people did sculptures or, you know, kind of bricolage, collage type, um, you know, 3D kind of montage things. Or you could draw something or you could write text and people did a lot of different things. But the idea was, was that you would focus on that in this ritual space, in this ritual mindset, and you'd focus on it, bring yourself to orgasm and then cut yourself in some way like like offer blood to it, offer spit to it, the fluids from your sexual, from your, from your orgasm. And then, and two types of hair, your hair from your head and hair from your down unders. 
and then you would you would let that dry and pack it off in an envelope and send it to uh, eventually me it was originally the the temple in in the uk but we started doing it independently in um, the us so that was a really interesting thing like i'm not sure like i mean the jury's out like some sigils work and some don't maybe and and that but one thing is i think that the big barrier for people there was i mean the, the lesson that i think was there and people that were there doing that can correct me on the phone and i'll share that with the people that aren't on the phone but i think that really like the the biggest thing with that was was sort of the lesson that those things didn't mean anything, that they inherently didn't have power. Like a lot of people that had deep occult experience were like, oh, well, I'd never share that stuff. Like that's my magical measure, or my something. And I think that just the act of sharing it, like trusting that, and then sort of brought you to realize that those things inherently don't have any power. They only have the power that you give them. And I think like, for me, that was like a huge, that was a huge like kind of conceptual thing and explaining that to people and going well that's the difference between topi and wicca and topi and the oto or something is we don't think that anybody can do anything to you with your with their finger you know if they get your finger fingernail pairings like and i still believe that to be true i mean lots of people have done lots of things to me but it's mostly been with their fists and their mouths and not like <laughs> not with my fingernails but again, I, I'm totally open to other discussion on that. Um, so anyway, we ended up, so we had a, we had a file cabinet that was locked up and, and kept in, in a sort of place where people couldn't go. And we started folders. We gave people names that were like just numbered names. We decided there were in the UK, they used Eden and Kali for men and women for, you know, sort of whatever they chose to be and, and it got confusing because everybody would get that name and then kind of a sequential number and we decided well two things happened well the first one was that we started getting naming collisions is what they call it in in um in in it where uk would reserve us a set of a set of numbers and then we'd run out of numbers and we'd have to coordinate again and it would skip and it was confusing and i really like the name coyote for a, for a, um, as a in, indigenous American name because it's a trickster and sort of would bring, I felt kind of invoke the spirit of, of our continent to the, um, to the thing. And we never came up with a good name for women. So they stayed Kali. There really isn't anything that's that crisp that I can think of. And that has that kind of, that kind of power and, and anger and, righteousness that that Kali has so that stayed and we have always like I think I can't remember like how we split that up but it was always complicated because there were Kali's in all over Europe and the UK and it got confusing to try and organize those numbers but anyway we started a filing cabinet and each one of those each one of those individuals would have a folder and we put everything that they sent into the folder and pretty much without comment just put it there and store it and keep it safe and if people wanted it back, we would have given it back to them, but we just, we kept it as, as, a, as a record of their thing. And um, actually when I decided, I didn't know what to do with it when I decided to quit. So I just burned it all. I took it to the, I took it to the beach and we did a thing like blessing it all. And we sent it to the sky and buried the ashes along a beautiful Creek in Colorado. So that was the Austin Spare influence. William S. Burroughs was another big one. I just got these pictures from Allen Ginsberg's estate and I'm so stoked. I interviewed, did I go? Oh, wow, okay. All right, so we are just about at time. So I'm gonna whip through this. We got, we got cut-ups and wild boys and temporary autonomous zones and control and information as power, sexual magic, autoeroticism from Burroughs. Geisen gave us cut-ups, dream machines, montage, permutations. Poets don't own words, which I think is a really important thing in there. And then here's some examples of Geisen's art. Jen would never cop to it, but I think Ballard was, was a subliminal influence. And because of the sex kit and the various things of using technology as rituals and using 
public space, like architectural space as ritual space. And I'm actually got an article coming out in Fenris Wolf about that soon, I think, right, Carl? And then Harry and Caress Crosby, hedonism, decadent Mishima, flouted societal norms, disdain for constraints. They were just wonderful, decadent, crazy people. And their lifestyle, I think, you know, like brought the joy into what we were trying to do. And, you know, various control speed freaks. Then we go to the ritual of the three liquids, which I've already covered. And here's a picture like looking out of my lovely basement apartment, my lovely basement flat with a dream machine and some various sigils and ritual things that I did. And a cute little standing nude by Michelangelo. And so in, 20, in 2020 or what, 20, 1999 or 1989, I'm sorry, 91. <laughs> 1991, I'm sorry, like everything's just flowing together right now. But in early 1991, I ran out of money and just like a bunch of the people that had been helping me, because I did not do this alone. There were people helping all the time, people coming to visit and stuff. And they were like, they became grown ups and they needed to have jobs. And a lot of them moved out of town, moved to Texas, moved to the West Coast. And I didn't have any help. And I just kind of hit rock bottom for a little while and, and realized like, just how much work it was. And was just like, I, I need to get a job for a while. And I liked the job. I was doing quality assurance in a nut and bolt warehouse and got really into like statistical analysis and this weird stuff. Don't like ask. But so I started, I just got interested in that and, and used and just kind of drifted out. I was just like, I don't want to do this anymore. It's too much work. And there's just like, it just became sort of, and having money was cool. Um, like having a job and like being able to do stuff other than like answer letters full time. So I stopped and a little while later, Genesis stopped. The temple didn't stop. And that's not my story to tell. Um, there's still a lot of acrimony about this. Like there was, there was stubbornness, I would say on both ends. Um, Please interrupt me and I'll, I'll correct this for the crowd in here, folks, because I know there's some folks that were involved with that that have opinions. But I mean, there's definitely still sour grapes. There were sour grapes until death us did part over the way that that went down. I, I would think that there, there, were, there was definitely sour grapes and there was definitely uh, stubbornness on both sides. I think you, you very much worded it very well. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, because I was sort of in the middle of it, because I love both of you, like both sides of that thing. And I was like telling Jen, you know, why are you being so hard, hard ass about this? And then I was like with and then with with the folks that were trying to start a temple or trying to keep the temple going. I was like, I get it. Like, you guys want to keep it going. But why don't you just change it to Church of Psychic Youth? Like you could change the name to Copy and switch well, the cross think, a little I bit. Was, I think there was kind of the effort to do that when... Uh... Uh, the San Diego station uh, tried to become a legalized religious entity in California. So it's yep. a church. And then yep. as, as that was happening is when the legal attack came from the Genesis side. Uh, so this is great. So I'm getting, I'm, let me, let me repeat that for these for the folks here is just like, so the people that tried, one of the people that was involved in that deeply has just, has just said that, that the, um, that basically they were trying to do that but the the problem was was that like they were getting sued like jen put a lawsuit against them as they were trying to like incorporate because it was just i don't know i think it was a wacky mix-up personally and and it could have easily been resolved if there had been some kind of mediation but there wasn't really anybody that could mediate no, there um, wasn't. There was and, an and, arbitration and, process. Like, if there would have been some kind of neutral party, disinterested third party, like if if the caliph of the OTO would have intervened sooner and sort of like brought everybody to reason or something, but it didn't happen. But yeah. Genesis and I remained friends for the rest of their life. And here's a couple pictures of us hanging out. The one on the bottom left is significant. That is the Love and Rockets porch the day before Genesis jumped out of the window in the fire. So this is like the morning before the fire. This is the last photograph of Genesis with a working arm. And then they, he fell out of the window. And well, he jumped out of the window because there was a fire in the Love and Rockets house. It was Rick Rubin's house in Topanga Canyon, like this amazing house. It's a story in itself. 
but um and so then you know here's my kids meeting genesis um i couldn't find the latest pictures here's me but possibly slightly tipsy with with genesis and lady j and i think bees in this picture are you not yes b hampshire who's here in london with us who was just one of the what did you were you bass what did you play for what's that no but i mean when you were when you were um in ptv what did what did you play in ptv you weren't you were just in all the pictures Wow, I thought you were actually in the band. Dang, I, I'm always like telling people, yeah, B who used to be in the band. He was in a lot of the pictures, like the Manson stuff early on, kind of Dreams Less Sweet. He was very much an ally. And so then, you know, I mean, we were there. I was there the whole time, you know, from 86 till um, 2000, 2020, 2019, 2019, I guess. So. And you know, here's some more snapshots. And I'm gonna skip the next what the what's next section. I think I'll wrap it up here because I'm out of time at the club. They're all telling me to stop. So I will stop with this. And um thank you for being here. Um thank you for being interested. Thank you for paying money. I hope it was worth it. Um it was worth it to me to have you come. We should maybe think about doing another one of these, Tom, with a couple of us, maybe. Totally, totally. The folks on the phone are saying we should do another one of these, like more virtual. All right, I got to drop though, because people are starting to load their gear into this room. So thank you very much, everybody. And um, we will Thanks, all see you on the other side. Yeah, please like like provide feedback and stuff. And I'll, 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 re I'll reflect this back to you guys, to everybody that was Sounds involved. Good. Awesome. All right. All right, take care. Thank you. You too. Thank you.